So I'm Jared Gardner, and I'm an assistant professor of pathology and dermatology at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences in Little Rock. And uh, I'm here today with Dr. Clay Cockrell, who is a clinical professor of dermatology and pathology at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas, and also the uh, director of Cockrell Dermatopathology. Thanks uh, for coming here and talking with us today, Clay. Look forward to talking with you. So, I'd like to talk to you about so-called dysplastic nevus, and uh, it's a controversial topic that gets discussed a lot. Can you kind of summarize the history of dysplastic nevus? You know, where did this all start, and how did we get to where we are today? Yeah, it's <laughs> definitely a quagmire that, that plagues our specialty quite a bit. Um, really kind of started off back in the days of Wally Clark, but before that, guys were noticing years ago that people had these large numbers of nevi, and they had an increased number of melanoma, and uh, that goes all the way back to the 1800s. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, but Wally and his group at uh, Penn were the ones who really kind of first put everything together. They, they noticed families, they put them together, and they, they coined, coined it the BK mole. And eventually they studied the histology, correlated with the clinical, and they said, well, this is a specific histologic finding that's seen in these people. And they thought it was kind of a, a pre-malignant lesion, in essence, sort of analogous to actinic keratosis to squamous cell carcinoma. So dysplasia, right. Using the term dysplasia, a histologic term, not really a clinical term, mm -hmm. uh, but one that's now sort of stuck. I mean, uh, uh, clinicians use the term. They, they use it just like we do under the microscope, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, is that what you call these lesions when you <clears throat> sign them out in your practice? Do you call them dysplastic nevi, Clark's nevi? <laughs> It's you a know, lot of we, names. Yeah, I agree. Or, or atypical nevi, right. which is what the, uh, the 1992 consensus conference said we should do. We use the term dysplastic, like you used quotes initially, sort of almost like a name. We're not mm -hmm. really using it more as, as the histology part, uh, but we're using it almost like we use mycosis fungoides instead of cutaneous T cell oh. and foam in a way. Uh, we do use the term Clark's nevus, but unfortunately there's just a whole lot of confusion of different clinicians trained in different parts of the country. They all want different names, different grading, and all kinds of schemes. It's really still very, very confusing. It seemed to me like there's a broad variation, yeah, especially like you said, geographically and based on what school of thought you're from. And now you were trained, you trained with Dr. Ackerman, is that right? That's correct. Now how did Dr. Ackerman feel about this plastic nevi? Well, he wasn't a big fan of the whole concept either. Uh, in fact, he's the one that coined the term Clark's nevus, saying that there basically was just a, it's just a, not a, not a pre-malignant lesion in essence, but basically just a lesion that is sort of like some of the other nevi that he named, like Miescher's nevi and others. So he thought it was just another variant of nevi. So this is really just a histologic pattern, not really true dysplasia, not something that we think will necessarily be more likely to progress to malignancy? You know, I, I think that's certainly what he thought, and that's kind of the way that, that I believe as well, and I think there's, there's some data now to even suggest that. And I mean, we all know that, uh, that growing nevi have BRAF mutations mm -hmm. and other mutations, but then they sort of turn those off, and in melanoma, those mutations don't get turned off, and the cells continue to, to grow, and you don't have the apoptosis, and so that happens. Well, it turns out in the dysplastic nevi, that sort of thing does not happen. It's, it, it's got a different type of genetic phenotype, mm -hmm. if you will, gen than a melanoma does. So it's probably not a precursor in the same way that um, an actinic keratosis is. If you actually look at the genotype of an AK, it looks identical to a squamous yeah, cell. Yeah, just an early form, But right. dysplastic nevus really doesn't do that. So my concept is more that they're kind of like markers. And just like you can develop uh, uh, melanomas in any type of nevus, congenital nevus or intradermal nevus, even rarely in blue nevi, it's probably they get a second hit somewhere and then they become a melanoma. It's not that they're sort of primed to become melanoma mm -hmm. they're going to if they don't get that second hit. So that's kind of the way we think about it. Interesting. Now, do you grade dysplastic nevi? And how do you feel about that whole concept? <laughs> I'm not a big fan of it. Uh, we actually wrote a paper a couple of years ago where we just recommend that we use two grades, high grade and low grade. And so we like to sign them out as just Clark's nevus, that means benign, and then melanoma, so really two grades. It's either something that you think might be a melanoma rising in a nevus or um, it's basically a nevus and benign. And a lot of people in my clinicians tell me, they say, well, I was raised that you know, mild, moderate, severe, it's a three-tiered system, and, and I want you to do that. So in the real world, yes, I do grade these for my, pay, for my clinicians that want it. Um, if I could just ma rubber magic wand around, I would say that really we, we don't need to do that. We're just trying to make the diagnosis of benign or malignant. You know, some of the lesions, too, as you know, are, are, are tough to, to draw that line. We, we some, some lesions have atypical features, maybe a little bit of pagetoid spread or some more atypia. And those, we, we tell that they should be removed. We, we, I think those are lesions that some people would call severely dysplastic. Mm -hmm. I think most of us agree those need to come out because, you know, we're not perfect. We can always tell when a lesion is just starting out to be a melanoma within a nevus, which does happen in these lesions as well as other lesions. So is that the kind of concept of evolving melanoma in situ within a 
uh, lesion? Is that what you use, or do you just call them severely dysplastic? How do you decide? How do you draw the line between that? Yeah, we, we will usually sign it out as nevus with some features, and we'll describe the features. We mm -hmm. say that there's an increased number of single melanocytes above the junction with some patchatory morphology. In our opinion, that we can't be sure, but could be an evolving melanoma, and then we recommend removal. And sometimes we're actually now sending these off for some of the special testing, like oh. fish, and also this new test that uh, uh, my path melanoma. We're using that. I, I just disclosure. I am a consultant for them, but uh, we're using these tests now. Sometimes in our lab, and we have a case we're really not sure about. Not routinely, but in a tough case. Yeah, sure, of course. So how do your clinicians treat dysplastic nevi? Do they all do it the same way? I, I feel with my clinicians, there's a lot of variation. Oh, and absolutely. It's all over the map. Makes me uncomfortable because I never know what they're going to do based on what I'm calling it. Yeah, all over the map. Um, we have some guys that they say, well, if, it's, if you call it mild, I'm going to just watch it. If you call it moderate, I'm going to excise with a two millimeter margin. If you call it severe, I'm going to excise with a five millimeter margin. <laughs> Well, I, I sort of think of that as, as a little bit of mythology because there's really, it's very difficult, uh, as you know, to tell right. where mild and moderate really is, so we kind of lump those together. Um, but personally, at least as far as from a medical legal perspective goes, if it's benign and you don't actually call it melanoma, the clinician isn't obligated to remove it. So for medical legal purpose, you don't have to do it. But a lot of clinicians say, well, I want to take out any possible chance that that lesion may develop melanoma at some point in time. So I don't fault clinicians that do excise them. A lot of them do. But uh, we're not usually, we're not recommending excision sure. of those. Now, I feel like I've seen some times where I've had dysplastic nevus next to a melanoma, but I also feel like I see, you know, congenital looking nevi and, and totally banal looking nevi that have melanoma rising them. Do you feel in your practice that you see melanoma growing out of dysplastic nevi more commonly than any other type of nevus? That's a good question. I, it, it's, it's, I probably would say slightly yes in some mm -hmm. cases, but I, I, I haven't really studied that quantitatively. Sure. I'd say most of the melanomas we've seen associated with nevi seem to, to not, there's so much melanoma there, it's hard to tell whether yeah. it's just plastic nevus point. or whether it's just another regular nevus that got overgrown by the melanoma. Sure. So where do you see, you know, you mentioned that in 1992 we had a consensus on this, and yet here we are still everyone using different terms, everyone doing different things. Where do you see us in 20 years? We're going to still be having... <laughs> The same kind of interview in 20 years? Uh. I don't know. I, I hope not. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, perhaps with some of these new genetic tests that are coming out, I don't think we're ever going to get to the day where we're just sending every single test for genetic testing unless it becomes so inexpensive. It's just like looking something under the microscope, and I certainly can't see payers at reimbursing for that sort yeah. of thing. <laughs> but... Uh, you know, perhaps at some point there will be some ability of us to, to get some consensus. I don't know whether we'll have a consensus conference again. It might be nice to do that, but unfortunately, we really didn't get consensus out of that last conference, so I'm not sure that's really the way to go. Well, Clay, thank you so much. That's a great historical perspective and a lot of practical points. Thanks for your time. Thank you.